Hello, hello, and welcome to Art Pop Talk. I'm Gianna. And I'm Bianca. Gianna, are you getting hungry for that Thanksgiving feast? Greens, beans, potatoes, tomatoes, and pigs in a blanket are coming my way, and I could not be more excited. (laughs) Well, before we get there, we are giving our brains a little feast with an Art Pop Talk on the subject. Today, we will be looking at feasting throughout our visual culture and think about the positive and negative associations with the idea. We'll be looking at works in particular by Wendy Redstar, who uses what should be a familiar aesthetic to the art pop tarts kitsch intended to satirize idealized views of American Indians. We will also be thinking about the action of cooking and the ornamentation of feasting and hospitality by looking at artists like Beth Lippman, who looks to the bounty of still lives. Then we'll look to the futurist movement involving gastronomy. Let's all gather around the table and start shoveling this art pop talk down. What up, what up, what up? Gianna. Hi. How's it going? How's it going? Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> it's good. Gianna, I have to tell you that last night, Andrew and I watched Red Notice. Okay. Have you watched it? It just came out yesterday. So yes. I, I didn't hear anything about it, uh, but Thibian and I went out to dinner last night and came home, and he suggested that we watch that movie because it just popped up, but I didn't see till this morning. It is currently 8.20. It's very early <laughs> for recording, <laughs> and uh, I saw that you had posted it on our story. And I was cackling because I definitely noticed Venus in the corner. I'm like. (laughs) So you watched it? Yes. Yeah, I did. What did you think? Oh, this is good. This is good. I'm glad you watched it. Yeah. In the, like, beginning of it, I was really annoyed with the narrator's voice. I thought it was, like, a really bad choice. And then I was like, oh, I get it. It's, like, like a commercial voice so it Mm -hmm. whatever it then it didn't bother me but then I was like this isn't very good or like this tone is kind of the tone that I would think uh you know an action comedy Netflix movie usually has Mm -hmm. uh you know Ryan Reynolds is playing a lovable douchebag like he always does (laughs) no surprise there uh, but then it did have a nice little twist. Um, it did. So, yeah, it wasn't... Like, I've seen some other art heist movies, which have definitely not been good, or, like, art thievery movies. There's a really old one with, like, the dude from Hunger Games. What's his name? Josh which Hutchinson. One? Oh, yeah. Is it Hutchinson or Hutcherson? H- Hutcherson. Josh Hutcherson. Josh Hutcherson, uh, where he makes like a fraudulent art or makes like duplicates. Oh, Do you remember that I haven't seen. No, I don't think I've seen that. That's a really bad one. I mean, don't watch it. <laughs> but yeah, this had a nice twist. It wasn't, um, you know, it wasn't like Lupin or anything. Let's be real. Yes. But uh, not bad for, you know, a little date night watch. Yeah. No, I actually really ended up liking it. At first, I was like a little bit skeptical. Also, when they just open with Rome and there's just like random works of art like in this museum and Venus. And then Venus is just like hanging out behind the rock in Rome. And she's just like Primavera was nowhere to be found. (laughs) There was no glass behind the artworks. And I just like had a little bit of like a mini stroke whenever the first egg like you know, exploded or whatever, and there's, like, smoke everywhere. And I was, like, the unprotected artworks that are just, like, Venus is just chilling, you know, in the background with, like, seemingly no protection over it. Like, I just, that would never, like, I know that none of these scenarios would ever happen, but I was, like, the damage that is being done to these artworks, like, the fight scene that's happening in the museum, I was, like... I also cackled, is it, I guess, is it bad that I cackled really hard when... The Rock was, uh, hey, sorry, kid, there's no food or drink in the gallery. (laughs) (laughs) But I was like, I actually, I thought that was great. I thought that was great. Because I was like, that's the one piece of research that these people did did about, like, the rules of a museum. (laughs) (laughs) This movie, The Bar, the commentary. Um, I will say, I guess the thing that was maybe the dorkiest 
part about it was this actual like egg concept. These three like eggs created for Cleopatra. Like it was the egg for me. I, I couldn't get on board with with like the way that it looked and everything. Um, but the Ed Sheeran cameo at the end was kind of funny. Oh, I was about to say that was my least favorite part. I can get behind three eggs. I could not get behind Ed Sheeran showing up at the end. I was like, all right. (laughs) Ed Sheeran really freaks me out. Like, I don't know what it is about him. I think he's probably a lizard person. Uh, (laughs) You know, I don't know. There's something about him. And also, like, who let him get away with this, like, new music, too? I just have a hot take about that. So I'm definitely not an Ed Sheeran stan, but I did think... Like this bratty girl having this like three eggs presented to her, and then having Ed Sheeran pop up was was kind of it fit the tone of this like yeah. dorky movie. It did. It definitely did. No, I I actually really liked it. Also, Andrew astutely pointed out that whenever they go into the tunnel, which I thought was a very, I liked that part the best when they go to Argentina and they find like the bunker. Um, I guess spoiler alert. <laughs> 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 this movie yet if you you know really wanted to save it um but he pointed out that ryan reynolds is whistling the little indiana jones theme and oh. whenever you see him in his little hat i was like oh that's very indiana jones and of course there always has to be nazis involved in like an artist movie i just like i feel like that was also very you know taken from indie which i didn't mind so much but the bunker was so cool and i wanted to i wanted more shots of like what was in the bunker Mm -hmm. like what missing artwork from real life do we think is actually there anytime i see gal gadot in another movie though i did this paper about people who play superheroes have a hard time getting roles or are they convincing as other roles because we have such ownership in these like fandom spaces. Mm -hmm. Um, And I like came to bat for like Gal Gadot. So in order to support my thesis of this like shitty film history paper I wrote, I'm like, she is amazing. She did such a good job, which I honestly felt like it was it was cute to see her in like a different kind of like action film. Oh, she was yeah, in but one she was with John so Hamm. Good. It was like oh, an yes. action spy meet, movie. Meet the Joneses. Yeah, I like that. Yes, movie. I know. Well, are you kidding me? John Hamm and Gal Gadot. That is the <laughs> ultimate fantasy. Beautiful people in the entire so, world. Um, yeah, you can bet your ass. I was I was like looking for Meet the Joneses. Like I was so excited. She can do no wrong. She truly can. She is, uh, I mean, like, I just, to state the obvious. She can stomp like, just, on me. Like, truly. Like, her. Tr- no, truly. And I just, I thought she was so cool. And I loved her, how her character was, like, this, like, evil kind of art thief. Like, I liked that, like, because I feel like with Lupin or other kind of, like, art heist stories, it's kind of, like, I don't know. There's something about, like, the... I don't know, maybe the the bad guy in those movies that's super not likable, but she was just so cool. And I loved, I just loved like her persona, this like witty, Mm -hmm. temptress, like outsmarting the guys at every step of the way. I just like, yeah, she had a little bit of crazy in her, but I'm like, what are you doing? Robbing the Louvre, like you're an archivist there. My worlds were colliding. No, that's exactly what I said. That that is exactly what I said. As soon as we saw the Louvre, I was like, she already works there. I know. I'm like, she has. (laughs) She already has an employee badge. Like, what are you talking about? (laughs) Well, I'm glad you watched it. I I thoroughly enjoyed the experience. Yeah, I was was very pleasantly surprised. Yeah, same. Good, good. We love a good art heist movie. Please, Netflix. Actually, you know what? We did ask, and Netflix, you know, brought us the content we deserve. Like, we asked for more art heist stuff. They gave us Lupin, and then, you know, we were like, please bring more, and they did. Yeah, obviously, Netflix is totally tapped into Art Pop Talk, and mm, they're just totally out of like, and call at the, this point. The higher execs at Netflix are just honing in on APT. More Gal Gadot art heist movies. You ask you. and you shall receive. Um, Thank you, Netflix. But I think it is time for a little bit of art news. What do you think? I love it. All 
Alrighty fam, we have a quick little art news coming from the art newspaper this week. Looking forward to Art Basel in Miami, which will be taking place on December 2nd through the 4th. For the first time, Art Basel will host an interactive exhibition of NFTs as part of a new collaboration with the open source blockchain Tezos. So I was looking at Tezos's website to like understand what that was, <laughs> what the open source blockchain was. Basically, it's my understanding that it's a, a Bitcoin agency and the website's language, Gianna, is out of control like i was like trying to understand they were like who we are and i was like okay who are you tezos and like did not understand who they were whatsoever I mean, honestly the more we talk about nfts the less i understand it yeah well truly but tezos is not necessarily like an nft <laughs> maker they are a like bitcoin house are they so it's part of the reason why just like all the uh carbon emissions and like they're storing all of the like are they like yes. the warehouse with like the the, the actual physical pieces of technology yeah, like they're like burning a hole in those uh, on layer i'm sure yeah i'm sure that's part of like the back end okay processes but um i was gonna say yeah i don't know much about bitcoin but i do know that it's really really bad for the environment uh because the mining process takes so much energy so Anywho, at this exhibition, visitors can create an AI self-portrait of themselves, then mint it as an NFT to go. Another word I had to learn while reading this art news was minting. Minting an NFT is how your digital art becomes a part of the blockchain, which is a public ledger that is unchangeable and tamper-proof. So similar to the way that metal coins like our coinage are minted and then added into circulation nfts are also tokens that get minted once they are created so your digital artwork is represented as an nft which can then be purchased and traded in the market and it's digitally tracked as it is resold or collected again in the future your digital artwork is represented as an NFT, so it can then be purchased and traded in the market and digitally tracked as it is resold or collected again in the future. So this exhibition at Art Basel is titled Humans and Machines, NFTs in the Ever-Changing World of Art. Um, this will feature a number of works from generative and NFT artists. The German artist Mario Klingerman has also designed an algorithm embedded into the exhibition space with which visitors can interact to create their own abstract self-portraits that are again minted onto the Tezos blockchain in particular. So that's also kind of another interesting collaborative kind of component of this exhibition with that big tech company that I thought was interesting. Um, the artist said, quote, while the body of work may be created by the machine, a self-portrait is a deeply human thing. So I hope this probes question around human nature and perception and all that expresses itself with automated systems. Along with the exhibition, there will be talks, um, a, a kind of series featuring prominent artists in the NFT world that will cover technical, philosophical, and artistic implications and possibilities created by blockchain-based art. And then according to a Tezos press release, the exhibition, quote, aims to raise awareness of the new dynamic that both NFTs and the ever-evolving world of generative art bring to the art world. So Gianna, what do we think about this exhibition at Art Basel? Yeah, uh, you know, I think aside from just like the, the concept, I think it's really interesting that they were able to pull together this idea really fast because mm -hmm. I feel like NFTs in the art world have been kind of a new thing and it wasn't yeah. that long ago where we were talking about you know art news and how this gentleman uh and this artist was just sold his digital piece at auction mm -hmm. and it was like the largest amount you know a piece had gone for involving yeah. NFTs so um I also think it is important and 
meeting that moment is important. However, I am kind of impressed they were able to pull it off that fast because to me, when I think of something like Art Basel, like it's something that is planned, like highly, highly, you know, uh, Mm -hmm. in advance. Yes, in advance. So yeah, I'm interested. I'm also a little bit scared. Yeah, I think it'll be interesting to see what comes of this, again, that collaboration with a big tech company. I don't think it's necessarily like inherently a bad thing. Obviously, it's kind of promotional in that sense. But, um, you know, I want to see with the, you know, this involvement of the art world, what opportunities big tech will create for art and artists and museums and, you know, people and items of that nature so i also um, i'm curious about maybe the art the artworks that we'll get that might be critiquing the yeah. nfts of it all too and critiquing yeah. the way that this like digital currency is kind of like also consuming the art world yeah um so that should be interesting too yeah it'll be nice to kind of follow up with art basel so again art basel is happening december 2nd through 4th so we'll have to uh do an update yeah. All righty. Well, are we ready for today's art pop talk, Gianna? Um, indeed. Definitely ready. <laughs> for today's art pop talk, we are looking at the art of feasting. We'll be thinking about the visual history of this concept, the art forms that it takes, and the positive and negative associations it has. And we'll be looking at the work of artists such as Wendy Redstar and Beth Lippman for some examples. Gianna, do you want to start us off? Yeah, absolutely. So I would first like to kind of start this conversation about where feasting takes place and that kind of history, ornamentation, and decoration of it all, which is typically a table, right? Um, I think this conversation lends itself well to a lot of prior topics that we have addressed. Um, You can think of something like a dining table or a dinner party in the feminist sense, like we've talked about for Judy, um, the ornamentation of the body and all these different aspects of like classic still lives or portraiture as well. Um, So I would like to kick things off with the artist Beth Lippman. Her art reminds us of where we came from, the subjectivity of history and the need for harmony with the larger world. So she is primarily a glass artist and is renowned for her sculptural compositions, which recreates the bounty and visual sumptuousness or richness of Renaissance and Baroque still life paintings, also particularly 17th century Dutch scenes. Lippmann takes elements from these paintings, these static compositions, expressive light, and opulent decoration, and translates the scene into 3D glass installations or works. Her objects, like those in the paintings, are chosen for their connotations. Overturned goblets and broken glasses symbolize human frailty and mortality. Such 16th or 17th century Dutch paintings are attested to the owner's wealth or the intellectual engagement that comes with that symbolization or those paintings. So foods depicted had symbolic significance, often related to biblical text, how the objects were arranged, the ways in which they were consumed, and how that consumption conveyed a message about the fleeting nature of time. So I wanted to consider her piece Banquetch, which essentially means banquet from 2003, and it's a 20-foot long oak table laid with 400 blown and lampwork glass objects. This piece captures a visual sumptuousness and excess of a feast like the one depicted in a 17th century Dutch still life painting called Banquetch. Like these elaborate scenes, Lippmann's half-eaten morsels, overturned goblets, and snuffed candles symbolically depict the impermeance of life. By rendering the scene in transparent glass and skillfully blending the various components, Lippmann demands that the piece be seen as a whole and not as this assemblage of individual objects. So to quote her, the glass creates a tangible third dimension, capturing the painting's polished quality. Its transparency suggests an ideal form, the essence of the object. 
So again, I do think that this image and Bianca and I are looking at one right now is a good example of this hyper kind of ornamentation considering a contemporary piece harkening back to these historic still lives. Uh, when I think of something like a decorated table, this is something that that's on like a formal long dining room table. I also think this idea of bounty, plentifulness, this ephemeral evolving and universal quality that is sharing a meal um, and also tying in ornamentation to that. So even though food and sharing a meal are universal, it does look different from person to person. So I guess I just wanted to give us a jumping off point to also talk about hospitality when it comes to sharing a meal um, and gives us like a tangible location for where a meal takes place, um, also in terms of politics and of culture as well. So now that we have maybe this like place or this history about where food kind of takes place and how it's been presented to us, but also, I mean, how it's been documented just visually, uh, we're going to kind of jump very far into the future, starting in the 1930s. And not only will food be documented differently, but we'll also get into kind of the more performative aspects of food as well. In December 28, 1930, Turin newspaper published a full-page manifesto of futurist cuisine from founder Filippo Tommaso Marinetti which we have talked about him before. So starting in 1909, aiming to revolutionize art, literature, music, theater, dance, and particularly food, rejecting the styles of the past to dynamically embrace modern life. So yay to futurism. Remember our lovely futurism conversation. But the futurists delivered a jolt to all the particular and intellectual activities that up to this point had governed the cultural, civil, and political scene. So gastronomy is the practice of art, of choosing cooking and eating good food, needed uh, essentially this good shake or reawakening in its spirit in the eyes of futurists. Futurist cuisine expressly defined by Marinetti as a true, quote, revolution of cuisine was described in a manual filled with recipes, menus, and suggestions. At the time, people may do with little and the food industry, except for a few brands, remained at the artisanal level. If we're looking at the Futurist Gastronomy Manifesto today, we can see that some of Marinetti's suggestions indeed found application. Some examples include using additives um, or preservatives added to the food or using technological tools in the kitchen to mince, to pulverize food. The recipes that then seemed so revolutionary were in some cases a preview of what Italian style Nouvelle Cuisine could be. And Nouvelle Cuisine is this approach to cooking and food preparation, in particular French culture. So it's kind of this like fusion of food. The forerunner chef of Futurist Cuisine was the Frenchman Jules Menkev, who joined Futurism in 1914. Bored with the, quote, traditional method of monotonous mixtures to the point of stupidity and propose, quote, bringing together elements separated by biases that have no true foundation. Filet of mutton and shrimp sauce, prime veal and absinthe, banana gruyere, herring and strawberry gelatin. Sounds gross. <laughs> Marinetti waged a famous and unpopular war against, quote, starchy foods like pasta, saying that it's this ball or relic that Italians put in their stomachs like convicts or archaeologists, which like this fucking guy, am I this right? This fucking guy is such a loser. He's not Italian. Like, get out. In addition to condemning pasta and absolving rice, the manifesto predicted the abolition of the knife and fork and traditional condiments. Um, and it also encouraged music, poetry, and perfume to be paired with meals as well. So Futurist also tried to Italianize a few terms of foreign origi origin. So essentially, they just gave different types of drink and food different names. 
So an example is a cocktail became the pola bibita, which I guess means multi drink, and there's a lot of other ones. So some of these concepts that are laid out in this kind of culinary manifesto um, are interesting, and I already mentioned a couple of them, but going back to the table, One of the rules is that there needs to be an original harmony of the table. There needs to be crystalware. There needs to be glassware. There needs to be decoration. And it also needs to match the flavors and the colors of the the dishes, right? All of that has to have a balance to it. The dishes also need to be utterly original as well. No basic plates here. There needs to be this measured use of poetry and music as unexpected ingredients to awaken flavors of your given dish. Uh, Another interesting thing is that there should also be no religious or uh, political talks at the table either. All of those things kind of need to to wait till after your meal, uh, which I think is kind of interesting. I think maybe in the sense of the futurist movement that is maybe a way to kind of equalize a a dinner experience. So moving a little bit forward, um, the Smithsonian did a good job of encapsulating food in art now evolving through time. So if we kind of get past futurism, kind of how they did pave a way for flexus and these other things, we can look at these other moments in time. So uh, really quickly, during the pop art era, food became a social metaphor. Our OG boy of APT, Wayne Tabode, painted rows of pies and cakes in bright pastel colors that brought to mind advertisements and children's toys. Presented like displays at a diner rather than this private life, this private dinner table that we've been looking at. His arrangements reflect an itinerant society in which sumptuous desserts signified American abundance. At around the same time, artists began using real food as an art material. Writer Sharon Butler uses the sardonic Swiss-German artist Dieter Roth, also known as Dieter Rowe, who in the 70s made a piece titled Staple Cheese, a race, a pun of the steeple chase that comprised 37 suitcases filled with cheese and other cheeses pressed onto the walls with the intention that they would drip or race towards the floor. A few days after the exhibition opening in Los Angeles, the exhibition gave off an unbearable stench. The gallery became overrun with maggots and flies, and the public health inspector threatened to close it down. The artist declared that the insects were, in fact, his intended audience. And so I think we can move a little bit faster and not cover this as much as these are things we have talked about, but this lends itself to flexus and feminism in the 70s. Things, again, we have talked about. We have Judy giving us this feast um, with the dinner party. So there is this long history. Um, And then again, we continue to see this combination of conceptual ideas of ornamentation and presentation and how that comes with the idea of consuming. So, Bianca, how are we feeling about this history? How are we feeling about, unfortunately, futurists giving us so much? (laughs) I have to say this is, I'm going to use our favorite phrase, wildly fascinating. I hate Marinetti with a passion. The fact that he was trying to abolish pasta just hurts, hurts deep. However, I do think that the accompaniment of like music and poetry and this added element that he's, you know, kind of prescribing with a meal is really interesting. I I like this idea of the Italian futurist cookbook. I don't like that it's like Italian futurist, but I think that of course we have this like you know, convoluted sense of cooking where he's renaming things like a multi-drink, a a sandwich is called a between the two and, you know, desserts were for standing up. It it just like, you know, he's being arrogant with cooking. And sometimes I think that there are these two sides of cooking, right? We kind of have this elevated status. We have this richness of food. And I think that's, you know, the indulgence and abundance of food, the idea of gluttony, which we'll get into in a little bit, um, is certainly present. But I also think that there's something about food that is 
really humble. And again, maybe we're jumping ahead, getting into those like positive and negative associations of feasting. But um, I really like what you're talking about here, Gianna, with um, especially Beth Lippman, thinking about that adornment of the table and how that relates to Marinetti and this idea of food presentation and your dishware and and where we even get this idea to decorate it, you know, your table. It just, it's all really, really cool. I do think it is interesting, however, that you're bringing up this idea of, of food being this humbling experience when in ways I think Marinetti is doing the exact opposite. I mean, mm-hmm. thinking about sure. Italian futurism, also working to like Italianize other types of food and being punny with it, but then also um, thinking of something like pasta, which mm-hmm. from like humble beginnings has turned like so much these days into like modern types of food and how we kind of reinvent pasta. How uh-huh. we can think about ratatouille. I think that with meals, there are there's a certain elevation but there there always is something that food can trace back to that is humble in nature and i think you see that so well in in ratatouille you know when yeah, well, I think she so. says that this is a peasant dish but you know it turns into this kind of elevated experience well and a lot of different forms of like pasta dishes were used as a means not to waste food and right. So I don't know. I think that's really interesting, too. We have these kind of makings of of trying to make a dinner table more democratic, but then also you're elevating food in such a way that you're critiquing, like, peasant food. Right. Um, so anyways, yeah, I, I agree, though. You know, obviously super interesting stuff. So continuing, I guess, to think about dinner tables in terms of being hospitable or being democratic, I came across a book that was published in conjunction with an exhibition called Feast, Radical Hospitality in Contemporary Art. Quote, Feast offers the first survey of the artist orchestrated meal since the 1930s. The act of sharing food and drink has been used to advance aesthetics, goals, and foster critical engagement with the culture of the moment. The meal here is used as a means to shift perspectives and spark encounters that aren't always possible in a fast-moving and segmented society. So the book covers a lot of what we just spoke about. However, there are some artists that were featured in their 2012 exhibition that I thought could be good to talk about as well in terms of feasting food and shared experiences. So in this exhibition, there is an art collective featured created by two artists, David Allen Burns and Austin Youngs, and it's called Fallen Fruit uh, that I thought was really interesting because this show um, or in the show, we have our girl Alsa Knowles, we have Marina, we have Ule, um, and then we have performance artists that have used food but this group um i guess it is a little bit performative in nature which i'll get into but this group uses it more indirectly perhaps uses performance indirectly they are not the ones performing it but they're really using a vast landscape for other people to participate so to quote fallen fruit we make our installations and plant fruit trees in public spaces for everyone to share. We invite you to experience your city as a fruitful place to radically shift public participation and the function of urban spaces and to explore the meaning of community through creating and sharing new and abundant resources like fruit trees. So Fallen Fruit is an art project that began in Los Angeles by creating maps of public fruit the fruit tree growing on and over public property. The work of Fallen Fruit includes photographic portraits, experimental documentary videos, and site-specific installation works. Using fruit and public spaces and public archives as a material for interrogating the familiar, Fallen Fruit investigates interstitial urban spaces, bodies of knowledge, and new forms of citizenship aim to reconfigure the relationship of sharing and exploring understanding of what is considered both public and private. From their work, the artists have learned that fruit is symbolic and that it can be many things. It's a subject and an object at the same time in its aesthetic. Much of the work they create is linked to the idea of place and generalization of knowledge, and it echoes a sense of connectedness with something very primal our capacity to share the world with others. So 
I also liked this example and using them in terms of fruit because that's something that's been familiar to us here on the podcast to also talk about. So we already knew that fruit is something that is super, super loaded. But talking about it in terms of sharing uh, this bounty, I think is super interesting. And of course, mainly what we have been talking about, even in the sense of the Futurist Manifesto, is creating and curating this experience that you have control over. Um, We have this documentation of dining experiences of still lives in traditional forms of art and painting. Um, so we've talked about that, but but what does it mean for food to be publicly shared? And I think it's this idea of the invitation. You are invited. Um, so I have an image here that we're looking at, and I will share this for our resources, but it's essentially a map. And that's kind of the visual record that I have of this piece. Um, when this uh, art collective documents it, its work, it kind of takes variety in, in a lot of different mediums, um, through film, through photographs, uh, but also this idea of the map as well as a public space. So, Bianca, I'm curious what you what you think of this collective. Yeah, this is really cool. I like the idea also that um, in terms of documentation, we have this map. I think that. Um, like the artists are pointing out, food is so tied with community. It's so tied with location and region and geography. Um, and especially when you're dealing with agriculture and where we get our food from, I think that's also another really interesting thing that we need to put into perspective as well. So I hope that the map does kind of bring that in or hone in on this idea of your food doesn't just come to you in a grocery store. You know, your food just doesn't come to you like ready to go wrapped in plastic. There are people and workers and land and animals and plants that all are behind where you get this food. And then it comes together in this very communal aspect at your table. So got me thinking too about kind of memories of my own community, which was a little bit fun for me. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, I have this like very recent memory and I'm sure it will happen again because I can't take Anna Maria anywhere because if she (laughs) walks past like a fig tree, which is, you know, there's not an abundance of them in Oklahoma, but she'll start like munching on somebody else's fig tree. (laughs) And um, we were walking by this restaurant that had a fig plant. And, you know, at first I'm like, mom, what are you doing? Like, get out of this bush, like stop eating this this fig but I'm like no man like you do you like eat this fig like it's a restaurant like it's this idea of like a food experience like are they really going to get mad Mm -hmm. if you eat this fig um also when Theban and I were in Arkansas too um and we were in the national park there was a lot of pecan trees and literally Mm -hmm. like on my little hiking trail I was just munching on these pecans and uh (laughs) I remember this public park this really really tiny park in Edmond I remember going there Mm -hmm. as a kid and I remember it had a bunch of pecans and I would want to go Mm -hmm. to this park because mom and I would like munch on pecans together (laughs) and uh so I thought that was also kind of fun for me to kind of think about like public spaces and this Mm -hmm. my like natural food source in suburbia yeah but also what what can your community provide for you in terms of nourishment like I think there is also something too where we forget that there's a lot of you know accessibility problems when it comes to food and our communities can create those spaces those natural spaces where fallen fruit is for the public like Mm -hmm. where it is for anybody where it's accessible um because our our world provides that for us yeah yeah so in thinking about our time that we have for today gianna and i wanted to think about gluttony and how gluttony has been depicted in art and um, I don't know that we have enough time to go in depth before we get into Wendy Red Star so I'll just say that we will link some of those articles that we found for you in our resources page Um, a lot of those images you know come about through Dionysus and Bacchus um, thinking about gluttony and you know the intake of wine of course and then we also get a lot of Dutch painting which I was thinking about with Peter Bruegel the Elder of course um, 
Paul Cadmus has a more contemporary work about the seven deadly sins, including gluttony, um, some work from Franz Halls, going back to Dutch painting. That might also link, if you're more curious, back to Beth Lippmann as well, and kind of thinking about those paintings that she's referencing in her more contemporary sculpture. But for time, we are going to take a little break, and whenever we come back, Gianna is going to talk about Wendy Redstar. and welcome back and let's get ready to talk about Wendy Redstar. Redstar, now based in Portland, Oregon, grew up on the Absaloka Crow Reservation in Montana. She earned a BFA from Montana University in 2004 and an MFA in sculpture from the University of California, Los Angeles in 2006, the same year she created the Four Seasons. The images play off historical dioramas depicting the artist surrounded by kitsch tapestries, plastic flowers, artificial leaves, inflatable animals, intended to satirize idealized views of American Indians as one with nature. So the Four Seasons art that she has created, this series, I think is a good jumping off point when especially talking about the kitsch of it all. Uh, because this is the time where we now are getting into the subject of Thanksgiving specifically, keeping up with our November theme. So I want to consider her piece, The Last Thanks, uh, which I found described as, quote, flanked by skeletons wearing paper feather headdresses. The photograph calls to mind the stereotypes perpetuated in elementary school each November. The Thanksgiving meal has been replaced with processed foods, included bologna, craft singles, Wonder Bread, and oatmeal cream pies, representing the food Red Star ate when visiting her grandmother as a child. The image is complex in its use of humor laced with religious iconography and allusions to tragedy that befell Native Americans after the first Thanksgiving in America. So the artist, Red Star, describes her work with, quote, the look pulls people in, but as you look closer, you can see the image deteriorate. And if you are more privy to Native history, you can see it right away. As one examines The Last Thanks, it is evident that Leonardo da Vinci's famous painting, The Last Supper, sparks Wendy Red Star's inspiration for this photograph. Red Star is even posed similarly as Jesus Christ. So she does use her own body in this photograph as well. With the obvious comparison to da Vinci's famous piece, Red Star's artwork, quote, successfully forces the viewer to critique colonialism and religion with every examination of the image. So um, this is actually a piece one of our friends and Art Pop Tarts had brought to our attention before. And I studied this in my Native American art history class um, in regards to contemporary art. So this is a very like revered photograph in native contemporary art. And, um, there are a lot of different copies of it with it being a photograph. So, um, I've chances are, if I don't know, you might have the opportunity to see this piece is, is what I'm saying. One of the things I wanted to say about this piece is my first examination of it seems like with the commercialized kind of Americanized food, right, full of, full of preservatives. When you think of like Wonder Bread, I feel like it's this like total like critique, um, like slam on like what America is, right? But it was interesting to learn about the description of the food choice and how she actually does have a connection to it too. Um, so Bianca, any thoughts about this piece about the inflatables? I thought in particular, you know, when I see these kind of like paper colorful um, like headdresses being worn, I was really happy to to see it be described as this critique of um, how in elementary school we dress up as pilgrims and Indians. And I think that really comes through. That's how I thought of it as well. This statement, she has this quote where she says, the look pulls people in, but as you look closer, you can see the image deteriorate. And I 
think that that is really poignant because just visually when you look at this image it looks like something familiar it looks like something that's set up as a western piece of art history referencing you know da vinci's last supper um but the colors the the table the kind of gingham tablecloth that um that the piece is using it looks inviting at the outset, of course. And I think that that's something that's really powerful because it invites viewers who may not normally self-critique to take a closer look and critique themselves and, and their traditions. And um, absolutely, these... I mean, it's horrific that in school, you know, Gian and I definitely had to do that in elementary school every Thanksgiving. You know, yeah. as a kid, you are taught that this is this is okay, this is normalized, this is what Thanksgiving is. Um, Well, and and I remember my first experience of doing that. I kind of feel like we've even talked about this on the podcast before, but my earliest memory of of doing the first Thanksgiving was, in fact, kindergarten. And it's kind of Mm -hmm. crazy that I remember it, but I remember rolling out a big... Um, you know, sheet of craft paper in the hallway and, you know, drawing like a dinner plate on it. And, you know, pilgrims sit on this side, Indians sit on the side. Right. Quote unquote. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And I also think it's interesting that this kind of like inflatable turkey in the background is the only figure wearing the quote unquote pilgrim hat, (laughs) you know? Well, I think the other interesting thing about this piece in terms of we have this reference to like early childhood education and our Mm -hmm. experience in America with with learning about and not learning about colonialism, right? Right. Is that we are given access to this side of the table, the Native American Uh side on the table. We are the the person and the viewer on the other Uh side. Uh Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah. Which is really interesting. Like you as a viewer have an active role in this piece, which is part of the reason why the photograph is so compelling. Yeah. Ooh, Gianna, that's really interesting. Thinking about this idea of kind of sides and your place at the table, your seat at the table and how you're going to participate moving forward. That is super interesting. Yeah. Um, I also... And I, I, oh, sorry. Go oh, ahead. Go ahead. No, you go. <laughs> well, I think there's something like clever about the aesthetics too, like the checkerboard tablecloth. Um, Mm -hmm. Again, these kind of like homey American foods too, even though she has a connection to them, I think it's also kind of giving me this idea of of a picnic as well. And I think there's something kind of that we think is like wholesome about a picnic or there couldn't Mm -hmm. possibly be anything wrong with a picnic. Um, Well, we also think of a picnic as being like white apple pie American families. Like a picnic is an activity that anyone can participate in. And, And you know, we think of Wonder Bread as being this, oh, this like Americanized food. Well, yeah, but you got to think about (laughs) Americans overall. It's, there is an association with white people (laughs) eating their wonder bread sandwiches you know that's kind of what we get in my big fat greek wedding but yeah but there's something also kind of within you know different regions of america and different people of america who participate and what food is accessible like what food is affordable that's another interesting thing about the items that she has on the table well also more importantly too again on the flip side flip side what foods are accessible to also Native American people today too, Mm -hmm. especially on certain reservations, like the markups of certain foods and the access to certain foods um, is also um, a a topic and a point that I think is being addressed here too. Um, You know, I think the subtle triptych in the background with the landscape is also part of that gesture towards this um, quintessential example of what a supper is in that religious connotation Mm -hmm. too um and then i think just kind of true to her four seasons series and work that really kind of helped put her on the map with the turkey inflatable in the background too Mm -hmm. um you know is is kind of like a marker in her work and that's part of i guess just how i view it too Mm -hmm. yeah 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 definitely well, Gianna, thank you so much for everything you did for this episode. It was so interesting. I feel like I got to learn so much from you today. It was mm. awesome. Uh, happy to help out, you know, doing my job as, you know, the co-host You're of APT. You're doing a great job. You're doing a great job. Oh, I thank you. 
my goodness, we are not going to talk to the art pop turds for a while. I know we're going to be off for a week. So we hope that everyone enjoys next week with your lovely Thanksgiving. Hopefully you are being conscientious as well about your place and your Thanksgiving traditions. Um, So a reminder, yes, no episode next week because we will be feasting with our fams. But Gianna, do you know what's going to happen after we return from Thanksgiving break? Mm. I do. I do indeed. Are you so excited? I'm so excited. (laughs) In two weeks, we will return on November 30th with APT fashion expert Joel Poro for your recap of House of Gucci. So make sure that you're all maxed up, get that booster shot, get your tasty little tartlet booties over to your local theater for a gaga extravaganza. And don't forget, you can follow us on all the platforms at Art Pop Talk. Email us at artpoptalk at gmail.com. If you like this content, head over to our Buy Me a Coffee account, donate to the podcast, buy us a little coffee so that we can keep going. And with that, we will talk to you in two weeks, our little tartlets. Yay. Bye, everyone. Bye. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving. Art Pop Talk's executive producers are me, Bianca Martucci Fink. And me, Gianna Martucci Fink. Music and sounds are by Josh Turner, and photography is by Adrian Turner. And our graphic designer is Sid Hammond. <laughs>